Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Abbas Ali, our orthopedics faculty with Marrow. Welcome to the exam recall series where we'll try to recall the questions that were asked in the NEET PG 2021 as well as the July session of INI set 2021. Now I've been teaching orthopedics for PG entrance exams for many, many years and there are so many things that I have learned about the recall sessions. It has become number one tremendously easy for almost everyone right now to find the answers of the questions immediately after the exam. In our days, when we used to give our exams, we used to come back and refer the guides and the textbooks and write emails to our faculties, hoping to get the correct answer to understand where we stood in the term in, in terms of competition. But although it has become easy, like I said, tremendously easy, um, when things become easy, they also become a little bit of a headache. And this is what has happened. You see, once you come out of the exam hall, depending on how you have prepared, you come with an idea of how the exam was. Some say it's easy, some say it was moderate, some say it was hard. And as the days pass by and the students start dissecting the questions, they realize that the questions that they thought were easy were actually hard and the questions they thought were hard were actually easy. And this comes down to uh, the fact that how the question was interpreted uh, by the student. Please understand that the students who help us uh, come up with this recall series basically recall the questions from their exam. And as the time progresses, they tend to forget uh, how the questions were worded. And when a single word changes from it can be or it should be or it always must be, uh, the options and the answers drastically change. So the aim of this series is not to get the exact answer or the exact replica of the question, but to understand what the examiner was expecting of you and to learn the concepts or the topic in detail so that if it comes again in the exam, we should be ready. Also, the other thing that I wanted to say is that it is very difficult for me to sit down here and tell you how, uh, you know, say orthopedics exam was or the orthopedics part of the questions were very easy because I'm an orthopedic surgeon and orthopedics is my life and this is the only subject that I have to read and study and so I know it inside and out. But you as a student who's preparing for an entrance exam that has more than 19 subjects to prepare for, uh, I can understand, I can imagine how difficult it must be. So there might be things that I consider easy, which may not be so easy for you. So don't worry too much about it. Just try to focus on what I'm trying to teach you and learn those points and be ready for the next exam. Another important thing that I wanted to say here is that once the exam is over, the students who have marked a certain answer in the question tend to hold that answer very close to their heart. They would defend it with their life to prove it. It is correct because they know that is that is the hope that they're living with, uh, that if that question is correct, that is a certain amount of mark that they're getting. And that is one reason why a lot of students do not like these recall sessions because they're looking for the answer. And based on whether the answer is correct or not, they are deciding their future. Please understand that the future is not scripted. It is still to come out. The results are still to come out and anything can happen. You might have marked something and you must uh, be remembering that you've marked it some other way. So don't worry too much about it. So sir, what's the point of this whole recall session? The point is to basically educate new people or the people who are preparing for the upcoming exams to know which topics to focus on. And the second is for people who have given this exam, I believe that the greatest learnings come from the mistakes that we make. See, when we make a mistake or see, whenever we have a heartache or a heartbreak, we tend to remember that very strongly and we have an emotional attachment to that memory. So same thing happens if you get something wrong in the exam and I tell you that it is wrong, you will never forget it for the rest of your life. So I believe that this moment, this moment of memory making should be leveraged and should be used uh, to remember things longer and based on these findings that i have learned over the years of teaching students i want you to come to this recall session with an open mind relaxed mind and look at the questions understand the topic and see if the answers make sense to you or not with that let's start with recalling the neat pg 2021 questions so the first thing i wanted to understand is look at the breakup of the questions that were asked in the neat pg 2021 we had four five six seven questions we had seven questions in total from orthopedics. You must realize that some questions must have been overlapping with anatomy and the anatomy faculty will take care of it. Some questions must have overlapped with radiology. So the radiology faculty will take care of it. And there are some other questions that must have been overlapping with uh, medicine and Dr. Rakesh will take care of it. What I'm trying to tell you is there are a lot of overlap in questions. So the respective faculty will do take care of it. But I will also try to answer those questions and if you want to learn more, you can learn from them as well. Uh, 
So there were seven questions approximately in orthopedics. And two of them came from metabolic bone diseases. Two of them came from uh, joint disorders. And one of them from nerve injuries, one from lower limb trauma, and one from orthopedic oncology. So I would say this is an even distribution of questions. But uh, nevertheless, not every topic was touched upon. But they cannot, right? So they will ask questions from extremely high yield topics, of course. So let's look at the first question and see uh, what the examiner is expecting of us. So the first question is, the following test is performed to assess. Now, this is a spotter kind of a question where the image is shown to you. The options are posterior interosseous nerve, a median nerve, ulnar nerve, and musculocutaneous nerve. Now, what do you notice in the image? You notice that the uh, patient is showing his hand and he is abducting the thumb, trying to touch the pen. So this is known as what? This is known as your uh, pen test. Right? This is your uh, pen test. Now, if you recall, pen test was used for assessing the function of which nerve and which muscle. It was used to assess the functioning of the median nerve, which was supplying, which was supplying abductor pollicis brevis yes so the answer is median nerve and it was testing which muscle abductor pollicis brevis which is the abductor of the thumb so a straightforward image based spotter a kind of a question but before we move further i want to quickly review the the nerves that are frequently asked on your exam so median nerve uh, i wanted to understand very very important allah nerve very, very important. Radial nerve also very important. In median nerve, what should you remember? You should remember the sensory distribution and the motor supply of the nerve. So whenever there is a median nerve injury, the sensory distribution of the median nerve would be affected and the patient would have paresthesia or anesthesia in that area that is supplied by the median nerve. So what is that area that is supplied by the median nerve? It is the, uh, the lateral one, two, three and a half fingers that is ventrally, volarly, anteriorly or palmarly and one, two, three and a half fingers, dorsal tips, only tips. Now, sometimes they ask you, what is the autonomous zone of the median nerve? The autonomous zone of the median nerve means it is exclusively supplied in terms of sensory by a median nerve and no overlapping from other nerves. The autonomous zone of the median nerve is the tip of the index finger. Tip of the index finger, please remember that. Okay, so that's the sensory distribution. What is the motor distribution? The motor distribution is as simple as it is in front of you it supplies almost all the muscles in the anterior aspect of the forearm except flexor carpi annularis and the medial half of flexor digitorum profundus right now in the hand what does it supply in the hand it supplies the athenar muscles except adductor pollicis adductor pollicis which is supplied by alnana it also supplies lumbrical one and two that's it those are the muscles it supply in the hand and everything is here on the slide you can pause it you can write down or you can revise i'm sure you know this i'm sure you know this so a simplification of what median nerve injuries would manifest like if there is a median nerve injury obviously what will happen the thenar muscles will be paralyzed so there will be wasting of the thenar muscles so there is wasting of the thenar muscles and atrophy and the abductor the flexor and the opponent's muscles that is the thenar muscles that supply the thumb for the actions of the thumb will be paralyzed so the patient will be unable to abduct hence the pen test will not be possible the pen test basically assess the abductor of pollicis brevis to see if the thumb is being abducted or not so once abductor is paralyzed what will happen the antagonistic group of muscle will overpower so abductor abductor is paralyzed so adduction will happen right flexor is paralyzed so extension will happen opposition opposition opponent's pollicis is paralyzed so there will be external rotation so you'll have a thumb parallel to the plane of the palm with wasting or atrophy of the thenar muscles this is what is known as your ape hand deformity right so you understood pen test you understood ape hand deformity that is seen in median nerve palsy now look at this splint this splint is used in ape hand deformity and this is known as opponent's splint Okay, this is known as opponent's splint. What else is the median of supply? I told you the median of supplies flexor digitorum profundus, flexor digitorum superficialis in the forearm. So if you ask the patient to make a fist, the FTP flexes the DIP and the FDS flexes the PIP. If you ask the patient to make the fist, you see that the index finger and the slight middle finger will remain open, whereas the ring and the little finger will flex because the FDP of the ulnar side is supplied by the ulnar. And the FDP of the radial side that is supplying the uh, index and the middle finger is supplied by the median. So in median nerve palsy, 
these two fingers will be unable to flex. But middle finger will flex just a little because it's in the overlap zone. So the index finger will remain open. This is what is known as your a pointing index or benediction sign or Pope sign. Or if you ask the patient to clasp the hand, Oshner clasp sign. Right? I'm sure all of you know this and you have answered it correctly. One last thing I wanted to remember about the median nerve is that the anterior interosseous nerve, which is a branch of the median nerve, supplies the flexor pollicis longus and the flexor digitorum profundus. Now, the action of the flexor pollicis longus is the flexion of the interphalangeal joint of the thumb and the action of the FDP we just discussed is the flexion of the DIP. So when AIN is par paralyzed, that is anterior interosseous nerve is paralyzed, there is no sensory deficit because it is a purely motor nerve. So the patient will have no sensory deficit, but these two muscles will be affected. So if you ask the patient to make an OK sign where you're basically uh, flexing the DIP of the index finger and the IP of the thumb, since it is paralyzed, these two muscles are paralyzed, the patient will be unable to make the OK sign and hence he will have a, a weak OK sign. Okay? This is known as Kilo Nevin sign. This is known as Kilo Nevin sign. All right? Now, what about the ulnar nerve? Quickly review, ulnar nerve sensory distribution is the medial one and a half fingers, anteriorly, ventrally, dorsally, palmarly, everywhere. And the autonomous zone of the ulnar nerve is the tip of the little finger. Now, what about the tests? What about tests and what happens if there is ulnar nerve palsy? In ulnar nerve palsy, you can recall there was a patient with a partial claw hand. You see, ulnar nerve, you'll get partial claw hand. Ulnar plus median nerve, you'll get complete claw hand and median nerve palsy, you get ib hand deformity. Okay, ulnar claw hand, partial claw hand. And what is the splint that you use in a partial claw hand or claw hand? Yes, you use knuckle bender splint. Remember, you use knuckle bender splint. You can review this in the notes. And what are the tests for ulnar nerve palsy? Uh, you have the uh, palmar interosseal muscles that can be tested. You have the dorsal interosseal muscle that can be tested, right? So for palmar interosseal muscles and dorsal interosseal muscles, what do you have? Palmar interosseal adductors of the finger, so you have card test. Dorsal interosseal are the abductors of the finger, so you have the Igawa test or the fanning of the finger test. And one more very important muscle that is supplied by the ulnar nerve that is in the thenar muscle group, that is adductor pollicis, that is adductor pollicis, and which test is that? That is known as book test. You ask the patient to hold the book between the thumb and the index finger. The patient adducts the thumb to hold the book tightly. And when the examiner pulls the book, since his ulnar nerve is paralyzed, leading to adductor pollicis weakness, the book will start to slip. So the patient will compensate by flexing the thumb, by using the flexor pollicis longus. That is known as froment sign book test. And the muscle being tested is adductor pollicis. Okay, you got that? Now look at this second question. A patient was brought to the hospital with complaints of pain around the left hip joint following a road traffic accident. On examination, the affected limb was flexed, adducted and medially rotated. In other words, internally rotated with an obvious shortening of the limb. What is the most likely diagnosis? So basically, an attitude of the limb is given, which has occurred following a road traffic accident and they are asking you to make a diagnosis. What do you recall if there is flexion, adduction, internal rotation with shortening of the limb? I think it's straightforward. You know, it is posterior dislocation of it, right? So remember, in posterior dislocation of it, the attitude would be flexion, adduction, internal rotation with limb shortening, right? So both of these images are of patients who have posterior dislocation of hip. Now, what about anterior dislocation of hip? There will be flexion, abduction, but external rotation with limb lengthening. Right? Posterior dislocation is the most common dislocation of the hip joint. Let's quickly review uh, the types of dislocations and their unique attitudes. For posterior dislocation, I just told you, the patient will have flexion, adduction, internal rotation with limb shortening. Whereas for anterior dislocation, there will be flexion, abduction, external rotation with limb lengthening. Now, these are pure dislocations, which means that there is no associated fracture. Now, if there is an associated fracture with the dislocation, it may not reproduce these pure exact attitudes. There may be a change. Anything can change. 
it can be abduction with flexion and internal rotation it can be adduction with flexion and external rotation there can be lengthening instead of shortening there can be shortening instead of lengthening and this makes the diagnosis just with the attitude clinically a little difficult so what i want you to remember is look for the head of the femur once the attitude that has been described doesn't match the pure attitudes okay so if it doesn't match flexion adduction internal rotation with shortening or flexion abduction external rotation with lengthening if there is anything changed think of it as a fracture dislocation now just based on where you find the femoral head clinically assume which type of fracture dislocation it is if you find the head of the femur in the gluteal region you would call it a posterior fracture dislocation if you find the head of the femur in the scarpa triangle or the femoral triangle you would call it the anterior a fracture dislocation and if you find the head of the femur in the pelvis on a rectal examination you can call it a central a fracture dislocation these are the maneuvers of reduction and the most common complication of hip dislocation friends is avascular necrosis right it is avascular necrosis and depending on the type of dislocation there can be associated nerve injuries if there is a posterior hip dislocation you can injure sciatic nerve and if there is an anterior dislocation you can injure the femoral nerve right so please remember the attitudes please remember the maneuvers of reduction please remember the complications now let me try to ask you the same question and see if you can diagnose it radiologically can you diagnose this dislocation radiologically you can see that there is a limb lengthening because the tip of the greater trochanter is at a lower level means it has moved distally means limb has been lengthened right and the lesser trochanter is fully visible means that there is an external rotation and you can clearly see that the thigh is abducted okay so it is flexion abduction external rotation with lengthening this is my friends anterior dislocation now what about this you see that the head of the femur is inside the pelvis pretty much a central fracture dislocation right central fracture dislocation on the other hand look at this image the classical image that has been asked in multiple exams there is a breach in the sentence line this is sentence line intact this is a broken sentence line the gt tip as it at a higher level means more proximal means there is shortening the lesser trochanter is barely visible or uh, not visible or invisible means there is internal rotation and the thigh is adducted okay so adduction internal rotation and shortening what do you think it is posterior dislocation okay now there are other options also like neck of femur and intertrochanteric fracture let's quickly see why they are not the correct answer here because although in both neck of femur that is intercapsular fracture of the femur and intertrochanteric fracture there is the extracapsular fracture of femur both the patients will have shortening and external rotation both of them will have shortening and external rotation right now neck of femur the shortening will be less than 1 inch and external rotation will be less than 45 degrees and in intertrochanteric fracture uh, extra capsular fracture everything will be extra so shortening will be more than 1 inch and external rotation will be more than 45 degrees although there is shortening and external rotation the best answer here is posterior dislocation because there is also adduction there is also flexion and there is a history of road traffic accident so flexion adduction internal rotation with limb shortening a posterior dislocation flexion abduction external rotation with limb lengthening anterior dislocation please this please hammer this into your head it has been asked multiple times on many many exams all right now look at this question a 5 year old child was brought to the pediatrician with complaints of bilateral knee joint pain okay. his bone mineral density is normal x ray image of the joint is given below what is the most likely diagnosis is it rickets is it scurvy is it metaphyseal dysplasia is it pycnodysostosis now look at this very carefully it says bone mineral density is absolutely normal so you can clearly rule out rickets as not being the right answer now what are you left with you are left with these three options now this my friend the correct answer is scurvy where the answer is very simple it's scurvy for reasons like there is pain in the bilateral knee joint because in scurvy there is subperiosteal hemorrhages where can be bleeding and causes pain subperiosteal right and if you notice very carefully what do you notice you notice this wimberger ring sign around the epiphysis this is your wimberger ring sign let me show you so this is an x ray of a patient with scurvy of the knee joint what do you notice you notice that the pencil thin cortices of the diaphysis so diaphysis will have pencil thin cortex 
and there will be ground glass haziness in the diaphysis. Ground glass haziness in the diaphysis. Why does this happen? You see, in scurvy, what is the problem? Because of vitamin C deficiency, the collagen doesn't mature properly. So it's an abnormal collagen. And collagen, if you all recall, is a very important part of osteoid. Osteoid is a part of the bone, which is not mineral. So you take mineral and add it to osteoid, you get bone. So osteoid is defective. Right? The collagen, the matrix, the protein part of the bone is defective. That is why there is ground glass haziness. So pencil thin cortex, ground glass haziness. Now what about the metaphysis? What do you notice in the metaphysis in a patient with scurvy? You will notice a white line, a dense white line of Frenkel, which is very, very important. And we'll talk about the differential diagnosis in a bit. Second thing, just below the white line of Frenkel, there is a lucent tremor filled zone. There is a lucent tremor filled zone. And the edges, you will have spurs known as the pelican spurs. But more important than that is the epiphyseal Wimberger ring sign, which is nothing but a sclerotic rim, a sclerotic rim around the epiphysis. And this is characteristic of scurvy for radiological diagnosis. Now, remember I told you white line of Frenkel? It is also seen in other conditions like healing rickets. So patient is on patient is rickets on vitamin D treatment. Once the patient starts responding to vitamin D therapy, there is bone starts to form or gets mineralized at the at the metaphysis. It gives you this dense white line, also known as the white line of Frankel. So how do you differentiate rickets with healing rickets? You look for the Wimberger ring sign. If you go to the integrated session, myself and Dr. Mayur have discussed this heavily uh, between radiology and orthopedics to make your life easy. The other, pro other problem with uh, inability to mature the collagen because of deficiency of vitamin C, there can be endothelial or blood vessel problems leading to bleeding or hemorrhages and hence the pain. So there can be bleeding gums, costochondral junctions, subperiosteal hemorrhages causing pain. Right? I'm sure you understand. And quickly going to rickets and why it is not rickets because in rickets you will not get the Wimberger ring sign and obviously there will be the cupping and splaying and fraying that you notice around the joints because the, the osteoid is growing but it's not getting mineralized. So this is an x-ray of healing rickets which also has the white line of Frankel but not the Wimberger ring sign. Okay, So I hope you could answer this uh, direct spotter wala question. Now look at this interesting question. A 60-year-old postmenopausal female with previous history of Collie's fracture came with complaints of lower backache. On evaluation, her T-score was minus 2.5. Which of the following statements are false about the management of her condition? Now, this is a classical clinical vignette where they have given you a clinical scenario with some relevant lab findings and are asking you to make a diagnosis. And once you've made the diagnosis, they're asking you to choose the wrong option of that diagnosis. Now, just by looking at the question, can you make the diagnosis? I'm sure most of you can. But if you can't, you can still look at the options to come to the diagnosis. The options are talking about teriparatide and bisphosphonates, bisphosphonates, calcium requirements, vitamin D. Something to do with metabolic bone diseases, elderly female, coles fracture. The diagnosis must be Yes, the diagnosis, friends, is osteoporosis. Now, that is the interesting thing about clinical questions. You have to first make the diagnosis. And if you make the diagnosis wrong, then everything falls apart. You have made the right diagnosis here because they've talked about T-score. And if you can remember, T-score and Z-score has something to do with osteoporosis. Now, let's look at the options. Teriparatide should be started before supplementing with bisphosphonates. Hmm, teriparatides before bisphosphonates. We all remember that the bisphosphonates is the drug of choice in osteoporosis. And that should usually be started first. Hmm. Let's talk about that. Second option is bisphosphonates are not given for more than a year. Hmm. We know that if we give bisphosphonates for a very long time, it usually causes complications like atypical fractures or osteonecrosis of the jaw. And um, so let's not use it for more than a year. Let's think about it. The other option is calcium requirement is 1200 milligram per day. Okay, sounds about right. I think the usual dose is around 800 to uh, 1200 milligram per day. So I think uh, this is true. Let's not worry about it. Oral vitamin D3 is given along with oral calcium. Yes, it's found that most of the patients with osteoporosis um, have uh, osteomalacia as well. So it doesn't harm giving the patient vitamin D. So yeah, be taken. True. Now, this is where the problem is. And a lot of students are getting confused. 
uh, what is the correct answer. Let's see. Let's see. You see, the patient here in this special question has already been diagnosed as, diagnosed as osteoporotic because the score is minus 2.5, right? And the patient has lower backache and there is already a history of coalesce fracture, which is a fragility fracture. So the patient already has a fracture or has a history of a coalesce fracture, now has backache and already has osteoporosis. So osteoporosis with a fracture makes it severe osteoporosis. Now, if you start patient on bisphosphonates right now, what happens? Bisphosphonates is an anti-resorptive. It inhibits osteoclastic function, thereby reducing bone demineralization. But it doesn't do much in terms of immediately increasing the bone density. Then what can increase the bone density? The anabolic agents like teriparatide. Teriparatide basically increases the bone density and that is what is required right now because the patient already is in osteoporosis. It is severe osteoporosis. The bones are already so soft and spongy might as well increase the bone density. That's why you can start patient on teriparatide even before starting the patient on bisphosphonate. There are studies that show that if you start the patient on teriparatide to increase the bone density and use it for the standard duration of two years, after which you can use bisphosphonates or any anti-resorptive agent to minimize the bone loss or to maintain the gains that you have achieved with teriparatide. So that's why that is not the wrong statement, still true. But, but, but bisphosphonates are not given for more than a year. Absolutely, this is this is a wrong statement because bisphosphonates can be given up to three years, up to five years, up to seven years even. They can be, right? So there is no limitation of using bisphosphonates for more than one year. Uh, that, But you should know that the long-term use of bisphosphonates causes atypical fractures or osteonecrosis of jaw, but that does not mean you should not use it. It's a very good drug. It helps a lot of patients. So you can, uh, you know, use it for more than a year, obviously. So this is a straightforward uh, wrong answer. I think this is the correct answer for this question if the wording of the question were exactly like this. So let's quickly uh, review osteoporosis just for the sake of completion. I'm sure all of you know what it is. It's basically a low bone mass or a low uh, quantitative defect of the bone. It has nothing to do with the quality of the bone. Uh, the osteoid is fine. The mineral is fine. It's just the density of the bone or the quantity of the bone is uh, decreased. That is why the lab findings would also show that there is no change. It's a very classical feature where there is no changes in the labs. Labs remain normal, meaning calcium is normal, phosphate is normal, uh, parathyroid hormone is normal, alkaline phosphatase is normal. The earliest symptom of a patient with osteoporosis is backache, low backache, particularly because of vertebral compression, uh, fragility of pathological fractures. You remember, please remember that before the actual pathological fracture happens, the patient complains of pain and that is why they come to you with pain, pain before the fracture. And the complication is obviously the fragility or the pathological fracture. And if that happens, it usually happens in the spine, uh, followed by the neck of femur, the hip, and the coalesce fracture, which our patient had. The deformities that can manifest are the kyphosis, the forward bending of the spine because of the vertebral compression. The investigation of choice is bone mineral density scan or the Texas scan, which has been asked multiple times. And the screening should be started by age of 65 years in a female, in a typical female. You assess the spine, the hip, the calcaneum, and the results are compared uh, between uh, patients of the same age, that is the Z score, or an ideal healthy patient of the same sex of 30 years, that is known as the T score. And we look at how far away from the standard is our elderly patient. Uh, that is called as a standard deviation. If it's 0 to minus 1 or 1 standard deviation away from the normal, we'd still consider it normal. And minus 1 to minus 2.5, we think it's osteopenia, one come away and minus 2.5 or less, we call it osteoporosis. But if it is more than minus 2.5 with a fracture, we call it severe osteoporosis. Or 2.5, minus 2.5 with a fracture is also severe osteoporosis, which our patient had. The classical radiological finding of the spine, friends, recall, is codfish vertebra. Right? So these are the recommendations for screening of patients for osteoporosis with excess scan. A 65-year-old female or more, a 70-year-old male or more. These are the other indications. The treatment is very important. We've talked about it. Uh, the drugs that inhibit bone resorption or anti-resorptives are bisphosphonates, the drug of choice. Denosumab, which is a rank ligand inhibitor. Um, selective estrogen receptor modulators like uh, raloxifene and tamoxifene. And hormone replacement therapy with uh, estrogen. Now, the anabolics or the bone forming agents are teriparatide, abaloparatide, 
functions. Similarly, romosuzumab, which is a newer drug, which is a sclerostin inhibitor, uh, which basically inhibits osteoblasts. So sclerostin is inhibitor of osteoblasts. So you are inhibiting the inhibitor of the osteoblast, hence increasing the activity of osteoblasts. So the enemy of your enemy is your friend, right? So that is what it is doing. You can learn more about this in pharmacology, all right? Um, Dr. Ranjan will do a great job explaining all of that. Uh, strontium ranulate does both the things. It is anti-resorptive as well as um, uh, anabolic, but we don't use it anymore because of a lot of uh, cardiac and hepatic complications. Whenever you start a patient on treatment for osteoporosis, you might as well supplement them for uh, calcium, vitamin D, vitamin K, and calcitonin. Calcitonin helps in reduction of pain in the lower packet. Calcium, the usual dose that you supplement is somewhere between 800 to 1200 milligrams per day, which is accurate from the options in our question. Vitamin D, somewhere between 400 to 800 international units per day, which is the correct um, dosage of vitamin D, right? So those are the things I wanted to remember. Uh, in terms of the long-term complications of bisphosphonate, uh, which is usually found in studies after the median use of bisphosphonates of around seven years, is the atypical fractures that occur in the subtrochanteric region. This you have to remember, these are the subtrochanteric fractures. So this is an exit of a patient who has been used, who's been using bisphosphonates for a very long time and she had this atypical fracture. Now you may ask why sir, why in bisphosphonate therapy, which is a therapy for osteoporosis treatment, are we getting fractures? You see, remember from my videos, I've told you that the bone strength, it depends on the remodeling of the bone or the bone turnover. There has to be a bone formation and bone resorption. And both of these go hand in hand to maintain the quality of the bone. Now, in osteoporotic treatment of bisphosphonates, you're inhibiting the osteoclastic activity. So there is bone formation, but no bone resorption, which looks good, which looks good. But since there is no resorption, it is not getting resorbed. So there is old bone there. And once it's not getting resorbed, new bone is not forming there. So there is no appropriate bone turnover. So no resorption, matlab, no bone formation. So that part of the bone, which has not rem been removed, is very old, must be weak, must be damaged. So over time, what happens, that old bone starts to break. And this usually happens on the lateral cortices under the trochanter, which should not be confused by loser zone or pseudo fracture, which occurs on the medial cortices. That is why I've kept the image here. Okay. So this image is of pseudo fracture that occurs in uh, loser zone or osteomalacia. And these are atypical fractures that occur on the lateral aspect of the subtrochanteric region. So prolonged use of bisphosphonate can cause atypical fractures like this and these patients may present to you uh, with pain around the hip, although they are on treatment for osteoporosis. Now what about the vertebral compression fractures? If the vertebral compression fracture is a stable fracture, you just want to help the fracture fuse with each other, you can use vertebroplasty where you inject the bone cement or if the vertebral compression fracture is unstable and you want to restore the height of the vertebrae, you can go for something known as balloon kyphoplasty. We have talked about uh, osteoporosis in great detail uh, in our uh, regular videos. You can go ahead and watch this. I'm sure you've understood the question and you're able to answer it now. Now, moving on to the next question, here is a question which says a 20 year old male patient presented with a history of lower backache and early morning stiffness for two years. He also gave a history of bilateral heel pain for six months. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Is it mechanical backache? Is it ankylosing spondylitis? Is it tuberculosis of the spine or is it disc prolapse? What do you think? Young man, morning stiffness, lower backache since two years. And there is no talk about radiological deficit. There is no talk about uh, weight loss, fever, cough. So tuberculosis of the spine can be ruled out. And disc prolapse also can be ruled out. You're left with mechanical back pain and ankylosing spondylitis. Mechanical back pain happens to us uh, when we do this prolonged sitting or prolonged activity or, pro or lifting of heavy objects in abnormal positioning that is mechanical back pain because of improper ergonomics improper positioning and usually when you sleep on that pain when you get up in the morning the pain should come down pain is relieved with rest here the pain is there or there is a stiffness early in the morning which obviously rules out mechanical backache so the answer here is ankylosing spondylitis now we'll talk about what this heel pain is in a bit after looking at this next question a 20-year-old man present with complaints of backache. 
morning stiffness and redness of the eyes. X-ray of X-ray image of the spine is given below. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? So this is a question which has a clinical component in terms of the history, as well as the radiological component in terms of the image. What do you see on the image? What does it look like? What is the diagnosis that you can make uh, based on the uh, clinical finding? 20 year old, 28 year old man, back pain, morning stiffness, redness of the eyes. Can you think of uveitis with morning stiffness, something to do with ankylosing spondylitis? Yes. It is ankylosing spondylitis. But can we confirm it with radiology? Yes, we can. What do you see here on the X-ray? You can classical dagger sign, which is a calcification of the interspinous ligaments, giving you this dense white band on the X-ray of the spine. The answer here, again, friends, is ankylosing spondylitis. So two questions in the same exam having the same answer of ankylosing spondylitis. A lot of students actually find it difficult to mark the same answer, especially if the question is, you know, very close to each other. They would say, Ki, ankylosing spondylitis was asked once. It might be a different answer altogether next time around. So there are a few people who made this mistake. Don't do that. Look at each question as an individual clinical case and try to answer it, irrespective of what the answer must have been in the previous question. Okay. Anyways, we'll learn about ankylosing spondylitis quickly, a few minutes. But I would request you to go to uh, the, the medicine recall videos where Dr. Rakesh will take ankylosing spondylitis in great detail. Uh, this is his specialty and he would love to talk about it. So I would recommend going and watching those videos as well. So ankylosing spondylitis is basically more axial disease than peripheral disease. So spine is mostly affected and it is an enthesopathy. Now what is this enthesopathy? It is a pathology because of inflammation at the enthesis. What is enthesis? Enthesis is wherever the ligaments or the tendons insert on the bone. That site is known as enthesis. It is inflamed enthesitis. Recall the patient with heel pains. He had enthesitis of the heel, the calcaneum, where ligaments are inserted. There is inflammation there. And that is why the patient had bilateral heel pain, enthesitis. Okay. Usually occurs males more than females. Most commonly causes sacroiliac joint affection known as sacroiliitis. At the sacrum, and the ilium, there is ligaments, the sacroiliac ligaments, and the situs, sacroiliitis, which is picked up early on MRI more than X-ray. These are the questions that are asked. So male patient, lower backache, uh, sacroiliitis, think of ankylosing spondylitis. Now radiological find, findings are something that are asked multiple times in ankylosing spondylitis. So in ankylosing spondylitis, at least in terms of orthopedics, if you can remember HLA-B27, if you can remember sacroiliitis, if you can remember male patient, lower back ache, enthesitis, it is more than enough. But radiology, you have to remember the radiological findings. What are the findings? Sacroiliitis, where you see inflammation between the sacrum and ilium, hence as white flare up on X-ray. You will see vertical syndesmophytes. So these are vertebral bodies. There is syndesmophytes that are formed vertically. These are ligaments basically, but they have been inflamed. And because of chronic inflammation, there is calcification. And when there is calcification of these ligaments, there is bone formation, right? So these are vertical syndesmophytes, which will give you an appearance of bamboo spine. So when these vertebrae start to fuse with each other, obviously what will happen to your movement of the spine? It will be restricted. That is why these patients of ankylosing spondylitis have spine restriction, movement restricted at the spine. And when the spine is restricted, the ribs will also be restricted. And hence, when they breathe, the chest will not expand. So chest expansion would also be restricted. Radiological find, trolley track sign, and dagger sign. These are some things that you should know and you should be able to pick up on x-ray. For sacroiliitis, these are the tests that you can perform. And remember, for the stiffness of the spine or restriction of spinal movement, you have Schober's or modified Schober's test. Like I said, the patient will also have decreased chest expansion and decreased lumbar spine movement. That is my case. That is my friends, the case of ankylosing spondylitis. Two questions coming from ankylosing spondylitis. And I'm, um, I'm sure that most of you have got it correct. Now, the last question that was asked in APG 2021 in terms of orthopedics was this. Let's look at it. A 30-year-old male patient presented with complaints of gradually a progressive swelling around the wrist joint for three months. Given below are the images of the swelling and the X-ray film, what is the most likely diagnosis? Is it Ebbing sarcoma, osteosarcoma, osteoclastoma, or osteochondroma? So 30-year-old male patient, there is a swelling around the wrist, and this is an X-ray finding. If you read the X-ray with me, you'll be able to make the diagnosis on the spot and move forward. There's a lesion here at the distal end of the radius. Rings any bell? 
distal node of the radius lesion what should you think first gct right yes is the growth plate fused yes mature skeleton age is 30 years and the lesion has started in the epiphysis and has moved into the metaphysis right it's an osteolytic lesion it's eccentric it's expansile it's a clear cut diagnosis of osteoclastoma ewing sarcoma occurs in the diaphysis osteosarcoma starts in the metaphysis and osteochondroma is an abnormal bone development starting in the metaphysis moving away from the joint right so let's quickly review osteoclastoma which i'm sure most of you if not all of you know this it's a locally aggressive benign but aggressive lesion starts in the epiphysis moves into the metaphysis and you should never make a doubt and never make a mistake here lesion in the distal end of the radius think of gct first and then try to rule it out how will you rule it out look at the growth plate is it fused or not look at any other thing that can suggest it otherwise so clear cut lesion in the epiphysis moving into the metaphysis growth plate fused skeletal mature think of gct but also remember that gct most commonly occurs around the knee that is the distal femur or the upper end of the tibia the third most common location is distal end of the radius but the most common tumor of the distal end of the radius is gct so please keep that in mind now uh, because of the lysis or the destruction of the bone there's a thin cortex there thin cortex there another swelling but when the clinician presses presses on that swelling the cortex breaks and gives you the classical egg shell crackling feeling now radiologically this appearance of the gct has been described as soap bubble appearance and if you can all remember what is the treatment friends it is extended curatage and please look at this image and try to differentiate between these two images and lesions most of the times you get confused here this my friend is a lesion which is in the metaphysis of the bone epiphysis is normal and the growth plate is open it's a lesion that is multiloculated multiseptate expansile and eccentric this my friends is aneurysmal bone cyst whereas this lesion is starting in the epiphysis moving into the metaphysis growth plate is closed mature skeleton and this is again expansile and eccentric this is giant cell tumor right now there are certain conditions that has been described as giant cell tumor variants these are the differential diagnosis but i want you to remember that aneurysmal bone cyst has the closest resemblance of giant cell tumor okay so just to help you pack this information into your head lock it and hammer it and forget about it for the rest of your life is this this lesion starting in the epiphysis moving to the metaphysis a giant cell tumor this lesion mature skeleton starting into the epiphysis moving into the metaphysis a giant cell tumor this lesion mature skeleton sc starting in the epiphysis moving into the metaphysis a giant cell tumor this lesion yet again mature skeleton starting in the epiphysis moving into the metaphysis but sir 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 what is the lesion that occurs in the epiphysis but before skeletal maturity think of chondroblastoma okay Think of chondroblastoma. Chondroblastoma occurs in the epiphysis, but before skeletal maturity. This is the point that you should remember. After skeletal maturity, think GCT. All right. Now look at this. Can you tell me what this is? Lesion is in the metaphysis. 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 Growth plate is open. Child. 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 Epiphysis is normal. 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 Looks similar to GCT. What is it? This is your aneurysmal bone cyst usually the students have confusion between gct and abc and to make your life a little easy this is your simple bone cyst which usually occurs in the proximal humerus metaphysial lesion single unicameral unilocular cyst the radiological findings that have been found in simple bone cyst are fallen leaf or fallen fragment or trap door sign Right. I hope you understood uh, how to approach these questions. If you look at it, it looks straightforward. The slight trickiness here and there. But otherwise, I feel that NEET PG 2021 had quite a lot of straightforward questions from orthopedics. A lot of trust was uh, required on your basics. And if you were sound with your basics, I'm sure you would have conquered them easily. Now, let's start with INI set recall questions. And please do remember that the whole aim of this recall session is not to check whether you got the answers correct or not, because the ranks have already come out. The point here is to understand what the examiner wants to test from the topic, to know about the topic, understand if there are any traps that can be laid for you to avoid, and so that you can do good in the future exams. That's the whole point of doing the recall sessions. So let's look at the breakdown of INI said July 2021 questions from orthopedics. There were five questions from trauma, one question from metabolic bone diseases, and in fact, there were two questions uh, from nerve injuries. 
but those those will be discussed nicely by the anatomy faculty um the, and i'm left with these six questions so let's talk about these questions the first question is an old lady who slipped and fell at home she was diagnosed with colis fracture and was managed with the plaster of paris cast what is the correct sequence of reduction is it traction ulnar deviation palmar flexion pop traction palmar flexion ulnar deviation pop traction pop palmar ulnar deviation palmar flexion ulnar deviation traction pop what is the question trying to ask you is it asking you about the position of the cast in colis fracture or is it asking you about the maneuver of reduction of colis fracture and if you recall what does reduction mean reduction means bringing the fracture fragments back to normal right so the question is basically asking you the steps of reduction of colis fracture and this has never been asked um, previously in any exam at your level so it might be a little confusing but we will understand what the examiner is expecting of okay. you the answer is basically traction palmar flexion ulnar deviation pop application based on the options provided but we'll go into detail and understand what the examiner wants to know so a little bit about colis fracture for the people who are uninitiated or who don't know colis fracture which you should know by the way it's a very very important fracture for your exam it's a fracture of the distal end of the radius at the cortico cancellous junction it's an extra articular fracture occurs in elderly post menopausal females on x ray what will you notice that it's an extra articular fracture and the distal fragment is displaced dorsally so how do you imagine this fracture would occur a fall on an outstretched hand with the wrist in extension the distal fragment will go dorsally right so distal fragment will go dorsally what are the displacements there is a dorsal displacement of the distal fragment that is dorsal tilt and shift laterally it will be displaced lateral tilt and shift the fracture fragments will get impacted into each other and there will be supination so all of these are the displacements of the fracture matlab there is a fracture and the distal fragment has moved away from normal in this position and this gives you the classical dinner fork deformity clinically so let's look at the x-ray lateral view what will you notice the distal fragment is going dorsally so dorsal tilt and shift and in the ap view what will you notice the fracture is extra articular and the distal fragment is going laterally and shifted laterally and there is impaction means the fracture has moved into each other impaction and supination now if you recall from our classes what will be the position of the cast in colis fracture once you have reduced the fracture you will apply the cast in hand shaking position that is there is some amount of pronation ulnar deviation and flexion so pronation ulnar deviation and flexion that is the hand shaking position of the cast right but the examiner is not asking about the position of the cast the examiner is asking about the steps of reduction so my friends this is the sequence of reduction that you should know the first step is to basically disimpact the fracture fragments that is with the traction and exaggerate the deformity with dorsiflexion and once you have disimpacted and dorsiflexed flexed again with traction you go for palmar deviation or palmar flexion and then you go for pronation to lock the reduction and then ulnar deviation and then you apply the plaster of paris so these are the steps of reduction if you are going for your internship or if you are an intern go to the orthopedics uh, opd and see how these patients are reduced and you will remember it for the rest of your life now the whole reason for doing this is i've told you that there is impaction of the fracture fragments now since it's a cancellous bone and if there is an impaction of the fracture fragments what will happen the fracture will interdigitate with itself so any amount of reduction that you will achieve will not happen because the fracture fragments have interdigitated into each other so what you need to do is you need to apply traction to remove it out now once you've removed it out you need to do dorsiflexion so you give traction and you do dorsiflexion and once you have done traction and dorsiflexion you bring it into palmar flexion that's how you achieve the normal reduction and once you have achieved palmar flexion you want to quickly pronate the limb to lock this reduction and then do the ulnar deviation to counteract or reduce the lateral deviation right and once you have brought the hand into that position then you apply the plaster of paris below the elbow in hand shaking position right so please understand these are two separate things the position of the cast is different and the steps of reduction for colis fracture are different i hope you understood and i hope you got it correct now the next question is a very straightforward one liner question match the name of the fracture with the site where it occurs 
So the options are Jones fracture, Bennett fracture, March fracture, Boxer's fracture. These are all named eponymous fractures. If you have watched my videos, you will remember why they got these names, what's the history behind it and the story behind it. And that helps you remember it for a longer time. So the options are just simple match the following. Let's look at Jones fracture. Recall Jones fracture. Sir Robert Jones described it. Base of the fifth metatarsal. So this will be this. So A will be one. Oh, look at this. All A's are one. Doesn't help us. B is Bennett fracture. If you recall, Bennett and Rolando fractures are the fractures of the base of the first metacarpal. So first metacarpal, B goes with three, B goes with three. So just by knowing two, you know the answer, right? So that is the answer, right? But let's complete it. March fracture, March fracture seen in military recruits preparing for March past parade, right? So this is a stress fracture that occurs in the metatarsal, right? Second more than third, right? neck more than shaft, right? So second metatarsal, so it goes to C, goes to two. And D, boxer's fracture is the fracture of the fifth metacarpal. Seen in, obviously, boxers, also known as pugilistic fracture. So boxer's fracture is fifth metacarpal. These are the answers. So let's quickly review these fractures. Bennett fracture and Rolando fracture, fracture of the base of the first metacarpal. Both are intraarticular fractures. But Bennett is a partial or incomplete fracture. We'll add Rolando, whereas Rolando is a complete commutated fracture, multiple fragments, commutated fracture. Now, because Bennett is a partial fracture, this muscle that is abductor pollicis longus will pull the metacarpal, causing displacement. So hence it is a displaced fracture. Whereas Rolando, since it's a commutated fracture, the small fragment will be pulled by the abductor pollicis longus, not the whole metacarpal. So this will be an undisplaced fracture. Is this clear? Right. And this is the fracture of the fifth metacarpal seen in boxers, boxers fracture or pugilistic fracture. Now coming to the fifth metatarsal of the foot, there are three zones that have been described. One is the zone one, two and three. Now, what is zone one? Zone one is the epiphysis or the base of the fifth metatarsal. Zone two is the metaphysis. Zone three is the diaphysis of the base of the fifth metatarsal. The zone one fractures are avulsion fractures or pseudo Jones fractures. Zone two fractures are what are we calling as Jones fractures, very, very important fractures. These fractures usually go into non union, and hence require. Um, care and treatment. And the reason for their non-union is watershed area, the vascularity is compromised. And in zone 3, you usually get stress fractures. Okay. Now, the point I'm trying to make here is, how do you identify zone 2 on x-ray? If you look carefully, to identify zone 2 on x-ray, what you need is to see if the 5th metatarsal is articulating with the 4th metatarsal. It articulates at this area. Can you appreciate this? Where it articulates? It articulates only in this area. So this is, this red line that I have drawn is the intermetatarsal articulation between the fifth and the fourth metatarsal. So this part of the fifth metatarsal has been described as zone two. So any fracture that occurs here is Jones fracture. Let me show you an x-ray. Look at this x-ray here. Fifth metatarsal, right? Lovely. And this is the fracture here, which articulates with the fourth metatarsal. So this is classical Jones fracture. And if there is a fracture here at the base of the fifth metatarsal that does not articulate with the fourth metatarsal, that is pseudo Jones or avulsion fracture. Okay. Now what about this fracture? This is a third metatarsal, right? And it is a fracture at the neck of the third metatarsal. Stress fracture, usually not picked up on X-ray. Investigation of choices, MRI. If there are multiple stress fractures, investigation of choices, board scan. Okay. Now, what is Schoffer's fracture? A very important fracture that you should know. Schoffer. Schoffer is a French word for driver. So in olden days, how did people start the engines of the car? They had a handle in front of the car like this, and they would rotate the handle. And once this crank was rotated, the engine would start, and this crank would come back and hit their radial styloid, causing an isolated radial styloid fracture. This has been described as Schoffer's fracture. Right. So please know these eponymous fractures. They are very important for your exam. We have discussed these fractures in great detail in the videos. We've talked about why they got the name so that you can help. It can help you remember. You know about lover's fracture, jumper's fracture, bumper's fracture, aviator's fracture. A lot of interesting names. And I hope you practice and review them.
Now, let's look at the next question. A 15-year-old boy was brought to the emergency room following a motor vehicle collision, complaining of pain over the hip. X-ray is given below. What is the next step in management? So again, a clinical vignette where they are giving a clinical scenario with a radiological image asking you to make the diagnosis first and then asking you what is the next step or the best step or the first step in management. All right. These kind of questions will come to you. Can you make the diagnosis here? So there is a collision, road traffic accident. Looking at the x-ray, what do you see? Here on the normal side, the Shenton's line is intact. Means no pathology at the hip. Here, the Shenton's line is broken. Pathology. What else do you notice? The head of the femur is not inside this location. And the lesser trochanter is not visible. Internal rotation. So internal rotation. And tip of the greater trochanter is proximally migrated. Matlab, there is shortening. Internal rotation and thigh is adducted. Looks like a posterior dislocation of hip. Just discuss this with a neat PGMCQs as well. So what is the next step in the management of a posterior dislocation of hip? Is it close reduction assessment of hip stability, 3D and CT reconstruction, CT and 3D reconstruction, a high uh, weight skeletal traction, open reduction and posterior pillar of acetabulum reconstruction? Any dislocation is an emergency. And the first thing you should do is reduce it. Obviously, after diagnosis, you should reduce it. So go for close reduction and assessment of hip stability. That is the answer. So reduce it as soon as possible. If it is not reducing, then try to reduce it, closed method only, but under anesthesia. Because what happens whenever there is a dislocation, the muscles will go into spasm because of the pain. They go into spasm. And so the relocation becomes challenging. Under anesthesia, the pain comes down, the muscles become relaxed, and so you can reduce it easily. Sometimes if there is a fracture or there is some soft tissue impingement which is preventing the reduction, then you can go for open reduction. So first close reduction, followed by close reduction under anesthesia, followed by open reduction. These are the steps. And once you have reduced, always assess the stability of any reduced joint to see if it's dislocating once again. Whether it's elbow, whether it's shoulder, doesn't matter. You check for stability. And then you apply traction or splint or whatever so that the soft tissue around the dislocation get healed. That are the steps. Those are the steps. Now, if this patient would have an associated fracture with a dislocation, you would still attempt to reduce it first. If it reduces, great. If it doesn't, then you can go for uh, 3D CT reconstructions to see why it is not reducing and what is the fragment that is there. And if required, you treat the, uh, the fracture that is the posterior column or the posterior wall fracture. A lot of patients who come to us uh, with fractures and dislocations. Right? So those are the things that you should know. In neat PG, there was a question that was based on the attitude. Here, there is a question based on the X-ray. So quick recap, quick review of posterior dislocation. Attitude would be flexion, adduction, internal rotation with limb shortening. And anterior dislocation will have flexion, abduction, external rotation with limb lengthening. And in fracture dislocation, it could be any attitude. But other than these two pure attitudes with the head of the femur found in the location. If it's in the gluteal region, it's posterior dislocation. If it's in the scarpus triangle, the femoral triangle, it's anterior dislocation. Or if it's in the pelvis found on per rectal examination, it's central dislocation. These are the classical attitudes. Reduction is an emergency. The most common complication is avascular necrosis. These are the attitudes. Here the patient has anterior dislocation. And in these, patient has posterior dislocation. Take care. These are the x-rays of various anterior central and posterior dislocations. Okay, I hope that you know how to diagnose them on x-ray. We have just discussed this in the neat PG MCQ. Now let's look at the next question. Which of the following is seen in osteoporosis? Straightforward one-liner question asking you the lab finding of osteoporosis. If you recall, osteoporosis is a quantitative defect of the bone, not the qualitative. Hence, the laboratory findings should be normal. So the patient will have normal calcium, normal phosphate, normal parathyroid hormone, and normal alkaline phosphatus. The answer here is normal calcium and normal ALP. Again, a very, very important topic has been tested again and again in almost every exam. There was a question from osteoporosis in the NEAT PG 2021 question also. We have discussed that in detail there. You can go and watch and review there. Again, remember osteoporosis is just a quantitative defect, not a qualitative defect. Hence, the labs would be normal. The labs are normal. The earliest symptom is pain, lower back pain, usually before the fracture. The most common complication is the fragility fracture that occur in the spine, hip, uh, or the coles fracture. The diagnosis is with bone mineral density scan. 
on the DEXA scan, you get a T-score. T-score compares the bone density of the patient with a young healthy patient of 30 years and you get a score based on the deviation from the standard. That is 0 to minus 1 is normal. Minus 1 to minus 2.5 is osteopenia. Less than minus 2.5 is osteoporosis. And if it's associated with the fracture, you have severe osteoporosis. We've talked about that. And we have talked about the screening of osteoporosis that should be started at 65 years of age. We've talked about the treatment protocol for osteoporosis where you can inhibit the bone resorption, that is anti-resorptive agents like bisphosphonate, denosumab. These are the good drugs that inhibit bone resorption. The drug of choice is bisphosphonate. We've talked about their duration of use uh, for three to five years. They can be used for seven years also, after which the risk of uh, atypical fractures and osteonecrosis jaw increases. That's why you have to give a, a drug holiday, a brief period of withholding the drug uh, for a year or two, and then you can start the drug again. The bone forming agents are anabolic agents. We've talked about teriparatide, abaloparatide, and romosuzumab. Teriparatide is something that you can give patients who have severe osteoporosis who need something to increase their bone density. Strontium ranulate does both, but we don't prefer to use it. You have to supplement patients on treatment of osteoporosis with calcium in the ranges of 800 to 1200 uh, milligrams per day and vitamin D in 400 to 800 international units per day uh, because most of the patients with osteoporosis usually have subclinical osteomalacia that is not diagnosed. These are the atypical fractures that I've talked about uh, seen in prolonged use of bisphosphonates. Uh, that is more than seven years. That is the usual median duration of use of bisphosphonates that has presented to us with atypical fractures. These are the patients who consume bisphosphonates for very long durations, come to you with hip pain. Again, bisphosphonate atypical fractures should not be confused with pseudo fractures seen in osteomalacia, which occur on the medial side. We discussed this in the NEAT PG 2021. Vertebral fractures can be treated with vertebroplasty and balloon kyphoplasty. Now let's look at this question. Which of the following findings appear late in compartment syndrome? Extremely important topic for any exam. Compartment syndrome had two questions in this exam. So you should know everything about it. The late sign of compartment syndrome is actually pulselessness. But believe me, most of the orthopedic surgeons do not trust pulselessness as any kind of answer uh, for um, compartment syndrome, but it is actually a late sign. And I'll tell you why. Because you see, pulse in diagnosing compartment syndrome is actually very tricky. There are patients who will be in acute compartment syndrome with good bounding pulse. There may be patients who may not have pulse and still far away from compartment syndrome. So in orthopedic practice, pulse is not a reliable criteria or a reliable clinical finding in order to make the diagnosis. But nevertheless, it's still the late sign of compartment syndrome. Yeah. Some of us believe that paralysis is also a late sign, which is, but among the two, the late sign or the latest sign, I would say, is pulselessness. And these are the things that you should know about compartment syndrome. See, whenever there is an injury, and the most common injury is a tibial diaphyseal fracture, what happens? There is an insult. So when there is an inf insult, uh, there will be inflammation. And when there is inflammation, uh, there will be swelling. And this swelling will further aggravate the compartment syndrome because the compartment that we are talking about are the, the muscles and the neurovascular structures inside the deep fascia. And fascia is something that we all know doesn't allow for expansion of anything inside them. So when the muscle is swelling up because of inflammation, the fascia prevents its expansion. So the swelling muscle will compress the other uh, neurovascular structures causing further ischemia which will further cause insult and this further insult will lead to further inflammation and this further inflammation lead to further swelling and further swelling will lead to further ischemia. So this becomes a vicious cycle and if you do not intervene into this vicious cycle, the muscles will die and muscles will go into a fibrosis and eventually cause paralysis. So we have to break this cycle of compartment syndrome and how do you diagnose this? The most important clinical diagnosis can be made with pain, particularly on passive stretch. For example, if the flexor group of forearm muscles is in compartment syndrome, how will you passively stretch them? By extending the wrist, right? So when you do this, the pain will occur. So this is the most important, the most important or the earliest clinical sign for compartment syndrome. Others are swelling, pallor, paresthesia, paralysis and pulselessness are late. And among the two, pulselessness is the latest. Please remember that. Now, this is all fine if the patient is conscious and can talk to you and can tell you about the pain. But if the patient is unconscious, how will you diagnose compartment syndrome? You have to measure the intercompartmental pressure. 
The normal compartment pressure is less than 10 millimeters of mercury. To diagnose compartment syndrome, it has to be more than 30. And what is the treatment, friends? The treatment is to cut open the fascia, giving you fasciotomy. Let's show you where we have uh, come to the conclusion that the pulselessness is the late sign. So look at this statement from Billy. Compartment syndrome is a clinical diagnosis characterized by pain out of proportion, increasing pain and pain on passive stretch. So a lot of pain. So pain is the most important clinical diagnosis. Sometimes if the patient doesn't complain of pain, you have to look for a response to analgesic also, which was a previous AIMS question. So you must have given a patient a painkiller for the pain. And now the patient is demanding more painkiller because he's getting pain. So the response to analgesia is changing, which tells you about the pain. Paralysis, paresthesia and pallor are late signs. And pulselessness is an extremely late sign. So these are the three things you should know. Generally accepted pressure thresholds include an absolute pressure greater than or equal to 30 millimeters. That is the diagnosis of compartment pressure by measuring the compartment. And what do you do? The treatment is fasciotomy. You cut open the fascia of all the compartments to relieve the pressure and hence the swelling muscles will bulge out. The pressure of the compartment will fall down. The capillaries will open up. The vascularity will resume and the muscle will survive. So everything about compartment syndrome you should know. Now let's look at this question. Which of the following is true about an open fracture? So we have to look for true statements about open fracture. Tibia and phalanges are most commonly involved. Yeah, it's true. Usually tibia and phalanges are most commonly involved. It's rollover by uh, road traffic accidents, bike accidents, car accidents, um, the car or tire rolling over the lower limbs. That is the most common. Yes, this is true. Usually no coexisting injuries. Uh, I don't think that's right because whenever you have an open fracture, it means polytraumatized patient associated uh, injuries will be there. So this is a false statement. Compartment syndrome does not occur in open fractures. Well, although it theoretically sounds like it is a true statement because there is an open fracture and the fracture hematoma is communicating with the environment. So there may not be any risk of compartment syndrome. That's what you think, right? But that is not the case. Majority of patients uh, who have compartment syndrome have lower limb fractures and some of them have open fractures as well because you see in open fractures when uh, there is an open fracture there is injury of the fascia as well hematoma does leak out but that fascia that is injured may not be complete and the fascia of other compartments may not be injured so there can still be compartment syndrome so open fractures do not uh, rule out a compartment syndrome please keep that in mind and so this is a false statement so early debridement should be done. Absolutely, early debridement, wound washing uh, should definitely be done uh, to prevent risk of infection. So one and four seem to be correct. The answer is straightforward. A, one and four are correct. Okay, so let me show you an image of open fracture here. The tibia is open fracture. Obviously, this is grade 3B and the vessels are also involved, grade 3C. Gustillo Anderson's classification is used. You see the foot and the lower limb. These are the most common locations of open fracture. And to quote you from uh, Bailey and Love, it clearly says that there are some common pitfalls to remember uh, about uh, um, open fractures and compartment syndrome. Compartment syndrome particularly, the incidence of compartment syndrome associated with high and low energy injuries are nearly equal. Right? So compartment syndrome can occur uh, following high velocity injuries as well as low velocity injuries because as long as there is an injury, there is an insult and there will be inflammation and inflammation means swelling. Swelling inside a closed compartment or fascia will cause a compartment syndrome and compartment syndrome can occur in open fractures. Yes, please keep that in mind and having a high index of suspicion to be particularly vigilant in patients with altered level of consciousness because in compartment syndrome the diagnosis is usually uh, clinically made with pain and if the patient is unconscious he will not complain of pain so you'll be very very careful and measure the intercompartmental pressure to diagnose compartment syndrome in unconscious patients so that covers all the questions that were asked in orthopedics uh, in terms of INI said July 2021. If there are some questions that you think I have missed. They must be covered in anatomy or some other relevant subject. I wish you guys all the best and I'm sure that you took away something very valuable and important from this discussion. That is to know the topic thoroughly because the topics are frequently repeated, not the exact questions. Don't worry about what you have marked in the exam. Try to understand what the examiner wanted to know. And once you know this now, uh, your future will be much more better with the knowledge that you have grasped. I wish you guys all the best. I will see you on the other side.